Hollywood, California, Monday, March 1st. The Lux Radio Theater presents Charles Winninger in Cappy Ricks with Sally Eilers and Richard Ireland. Lux presents Hollywood. Our stars, Charles Winninger, Sally Eilers, and Richard Arlen. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our guests, Peter B. Kine, renowned author and creator of Cappy Ricks, and Royer, Hollywood's eminent wardrobe designer from 20th Century Fox Studios. Our conductor, Mr. Louis Silvers. This program comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, who welcome you all to another hour in the film capital of the world. Before we start, Cappy Ricks, a word about the product which sponsors tonight's play, Lux Flakes. Since I've been the announcer on the Lux program, I've been very much impressed with the real enthusiasm women have for Lux Flakes. They rely on it in so many ways, and they tell me it never lets them down. To show what I mean, here's a letter a New England girl sat down and wrote to the makers of Lux Flakes. I found that in order to buy a pair of stockings every week, I had to give up too many good times. I decided to try Lux Flakes and see if it made any difference. I found that with Lux, I only needed to buy a pair a month. Now I use nothing but Lux Flakes on stockings and dainty underwear. And with the money I save every year, I'm able to pay for half of my vacation. And now, our producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. A week ago, while cruising the bayous of Louisiana, among the most beautiful and isolated communities in the world, I came on a tiny fishing village, standing on stilts, and soft with the talk of Arcadian fishermen. Situated on Bayou Barataria, it was named Lafitte, for the pirate and patriot I'm to make the hero of my next picture, the buccaneer. To this little town, Lafitte returned from his raids, laden with spoils, his dark, handsome face flushed with the conquest of Spanish merchantmen. And here he auctioned off his loot. Entering the general store to buy provisions for the rest of our journey, I looked into the corners where shadows sprawled like sailors gone to sleep. Instead of the chests of Spanish gold, the priceless fabrics of the East, and the heaps of jewels that reposed there when we bought Louisiana from Napoleon, on the shelves, I give you my word, there were neatly arranged cartons of Lux Flakes. I was surprised and amused as when I observed some months ago the coincidence that Lux has been one of the words on my family crest for 870 years. Since then, we returned to Hollywood by way of New Orleans, where the famous, famous uh, Bonnet Carré spillway, diverting more water per second than flows over Niagara Falls, forms an impregnable defense against the ravenous Mississippi. The city is safer than it was from the old buccaneers. But tonight, our hero is not Jean Lafitte. It's Charles Winninger, who made his professional debut as a fiddling member of his father's troupe at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. Like another fiddling prodigy, Jack Bennett. Jack Benny. (laughs) Charlie realized, after a time, that he was hiding his talent under a Stradivarius. So he sold his violin and turned comedian. His talents are currently on view in Universal's Three Smart Girls. But millions remember him as Captain Andy in Ziegfeld's showboat. Tonight he again wears gold braid in the role of Cappy Rick, as peppery an old salt as ever shivered a timber. Heard as his daughter, Florrie, is Sally Eilers, who went from Max Sennett comedies to stardom in all ten of Hollywood's important studios and starred with James Dunn in the Academy Award winner, Bad Girl. She appears shortly with Jimmy in the universal picture, We Have Our Moments. Tonight she has for her leading man, Richard Arlen, who prepared for this picture by appearing in more than 60 pictures. Dick has just returned from England where he made the Great Barrier. We hear him tonight as Matt Peasley. And now, it's anchors away as the Lux Radio Theater presents Charles Winninger, Sally Eilers, and Richard Arlen 
in Peter B. Kind's story, Cappy Rick. Francisco waterfront, where row after row of shipping officers faced the busy wharves. On the steps of the Blue Star Line, Cappy Ricks, the president, faces a huge crowd of sailors and ship owners. In typical waterfront fashion, they're congratulating the old-timer on his 60th birthday. and been licked. We've made money, lost, and made it again. We've matched our wits against each other, not so much for the dollars as for the fun of the game. And now, as I look down on you from the peak of 60 years, I'm going to ask my first favor of you. What is it, Cappy? Go down to the dock, all of you, and jump in the bay. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Ricks. Congratulations. Thanks, Skinner. Thanks. I didn't think you'd be coming to the office this morning. I didn't think I'd get here myself when that crowd got a hold of me. Morning, Miss Brown. Good morning, sir. The boys were a little excited, excited. sir. Excited? They've lost their senses. I don't see why a man can't reach the age of 60 without a bunch of hoodlums making a monkey out of him. Yes, sir. It is a shame, sir. What's that? Oh, why, nothing, Mr. Ricks. I just said that I thought it was a shame. Yeah, you, you did think they did make a monkey out of me. Oh, no, sir, not at all. <laughs> There's no man can make a monkey out of Cappy Rick Skinner, nor a crowd of men. Remember that. Yes, sir. And don't keep yesing me all the oh, time. yes, sir. Has there been any word from that hoodoo ship of ours? Oh, the retriever. No, not a thing, sir. She can't possibly make port inside of a week or ten days. I know that, you darn fool. I didn't say anything about her making port. But some steamer might have picked her up and reported. I haven't heard a thing, sir. <laughs> you can bet I equip that barkentine with radio the minute she hits port. Oh, you have an appointment with your lawyers, Gordon and Gordon, this morning to talk over your rights concerning the boat, sir. What time? Half an hour in their office. I'll be there. Anything else? Oh, yes, sir. Your daughter is here. What? Where? In your office, sir. Well, why didn't you tell me, you knock-kneed landlubber? Well, I'm sorry, sir. I, I, it's... I'll be in the office. Now, listen, I don't want to be disturbed. No, sir. I'll see to that, sir. Hello, Flory. Hello, Dad. How are you, darling? Ah. What are you doing down here at this hour? Your Aunt Lucy said you skipped out of the house before breakfast. I want to speak to you alone, Dad. Huh? What yeah. about? Well, first, to congratulate you. I owe you 60 kisses, you know. One for each year. That's so? <laughs> I'll collect them on the installment plan. One at a time. All right. Here's the first. <laughs> that is a good one. <laughs> Must be something behind it. Dad. Come on, out with it. How much do you want this time? Not a penny. No? No. It's something more than money, Dad. Something I want terribly. Mm -hmm. Well? It, it's what I was speaking about the other night at dinner. Now, Flory, don't start that all over again. But, Dad... I told you once and for all that I don't want you working down here at the office. But, Dad, listen... In the first place, it ain't necessary... And in the second place, you don't know anything about the shipping business anyhow. But I do. I've been around the docks with you ever since I was old enough to walk. And I've listened to you talk every night at dinner for the last 15 years. I know as much as anyone knows, and I want to come in with you. Work with you. Now, Flory, listen to me. Well, I don't see. I don't know why I should be talk seriously about this. It's silly. But I want to tell you something. The shipping business is no business for a girl. Hmm. It's a man's game, a fighting game. It's give and take every minute of the day. And if I went and took you in as a partner, my competitors would laugh me off the waterfront. I don't have to be a partner. No, nor anything else around here. I won't have it. Is that your final answer, Dad? Absolute. Oh, Flory, now don't act so hurt. I'll do anything in the world for you except this. I can't do this. It's all right. But I haven't given up yet. Now, Flory. You always said I was stubborn. You certainly are. And that I take after you. <laughs> well, yes. You're too much like me for your own good. Oh, Mr. Ricks. Yes, what is it? Your appointment with Mr. Gordon, sir. It's almost time. All right, all right. Don't rush me. Oh, no, sir. I didn't mean to rush you. Well, get me a cab. Oh, yes, sir. And be quick about it. We've got to get out of here. Oh, yes, sir. Now, 
Now, let me get this straight, Mr. Ricks. You say your ship, the Retriever, lost its captain off Cape Town? Yes, he got sick. It was very sudden. I see. And the mate took over command? Yes. A fellow by the name of Matt Peasley. He, uh... Oh, look, Mr. Gordon. When's your pa coming back? He knows the whole story from bow to stern. He's away, Mr. Ricks. Won't be back for a week. I... I'm taking charge. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, go on. Now, as I understand it, uh, you didn't want Matt Peasy to act as captain. Why should I? I don't know the fella. Never laid eyes on him. So I wired him I was sending another captain to take over the ship. And what do you suppose that scallywag did? What? Wired us that he was going to bring the ship back himself. And if we sent on another captain, he'd chuck him overboard. Hmm. What did you do then? Do? I'll tell you what I did. I hunted up the biggest, toughest captain I could find. A big, burly Swede. A two-fisted human bull who's licked everything on the seven seas. And I shipped him off to Cape Town with orders to beat Mr. Peasley to a pulp. And bring what was left of him back in the retriever. I see. Now, here's what I want to see you about. That ship will be in here within a week or ten days. And the minute she comes to anchor, they'll bring the pieces of Mr. Matt Peasley ashore. Then what's left of him will begin to yell for the police. So I want to know just where I get off at. The assault took place in a foreign port. But on an American ship flying the American flag. Now, don't forget that. Well, what's the answer? Well, uh, let me see. Uh, oh, now, come uh, on. Come on. Do I land in the brig or don't I? Well, to be quite frank with you, Mr. Rex, I, uh, I, uh, I don't know. Well, that's just fine. Just fine. I sit here for an hour wasting my breath, and you tell me you don't know. What's a maritime lawyer for, anyhow? Uh, when my father gets back, you see, it's a very unusual case. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ricks, I... Uh... All right, all right, all right. Forget it, son. The youngster can't know everything about this business. Oh, I, uh, I'll look up the case records. Never mind, I ain't got time. And the ship ain't due for a week. You just tell your pa to give me a hail as soon as he hits port. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, forget it. Well, come on, Skinner. Oh, I beg pardon. Don't sir. sit there with your mouth hanging open. We got work to do. Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Sir. So long, son. Oh, goodbye, sir. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, hello, Miss Rex. Did my father get back yet? No, ma'am. I guess he's still over at Gordon and Gordon. Is this Brown in? Nope. Out to lunch. Everybody's out to lunch except me. What's the matter with you, Jimmy? Oh, I got to stay in mind the office. And I got some important typing to do. And you're starving, I suppose. Well, I haven't eaten since breakfast. But I guess I can last another five minutes or so. <laughs> you go but... ahead out. I'll do the typing. Oh, you think it'll be all right? Sure, run along. Gee, thanks. Thanks, Miss Ricks. Don't be long, though. I won't. Come in. Well, how do you do? Hello. Mr. Ricks in? What's the name, please? Matt Peasley, Captain of the Retriever. The Retriever? The Retriever isn't in yet. Oh, yes, it is. Anchored off of Meg's Wharf not 20 minutes ago. Who's in command? Me. But, but Captain Peterson. Oh, you mean that big, sweet old Rick sent out to Cape Town to take charge? Yes. I brought him ashore and sent him up to the Marine Hospital. What? You... You mean to say that you... That you licked him? Well, if I hadn't, he'd have licked me. Hey, you ought to take a peep at him. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid I don't understand. Oh, excuse me, but I can't help it. It's too funny. Do you know that fight has been the talk of this office for the past three weeks? Yeah? Everybody took it for granted that Captain Peterson would win. You're not Rick's mind, huh? Night and day. He's talked of it, boasted of it, gloated of it, over it. You see, you're the only man in his employ who ever defied him. Well, he probably needs someone to tell him off once in a while. <laughs> He's just an old windbag anyhow. What? Oh, uh, I guess I shouldn't have said that, huh? You've got to be loyal to him working in his office and all. Working? You're his secretary, aren't you? Well, not exactly. Been with him long? Long? Oh, yes. Ever since I was a little girl. He, uh, he's been like a father to me. He's not so bad when you know him. Bark worse than the bite, huh? That's it. Tell me something. How on earth did you get the retriever back so fast? You weren't due for a week. Oh, just luck, I guess. Well, luck wouldn't speed you up seven days. Well, I, I've been at it ever since I was 14. Was the retriever your first command? Yeah, that's why I jumped at the chance. I I couldn't let that big ape Peterson take it over. Oh. But you know, Mr. Ricks is pretty powerful. He could keep you from getting another boat. 
Well, I expect him to do that. What are you going to do? Me? I'm uh, I'm going to give up the sea. I'm going to go into the shipping business for myself. You are? That'll take money. Well, I found out that if you can show people a sure bet, the sense to find the money. Oh, you have something sure. Dead sure. Mm. You see, I know where I can pick up a couple of ships right now. And for $10,000, I could swing the whole deal. Buy up the options, turn around, sell the boats, and net a profit of 100%. That'd be enough to give me a start. You could do that for $10,000? Sure. You could? Yeah, I got half of it now. All I need is another five. Captain Peasley, if if I get $5,000, would you take me in with you? You? As a partner. Are you kidding? No, I'm not. Where would a secretary get $5,000? Oh, well, you see, I have a brother who has plenty of money. He let me have some to invest in a sure thing like this. You're a funny kid. What's your name? Uh, Brown. Ellen Brown. You don't seem quite sure of it. Oh, of course I am. Well, I'll tell you, Miss Brown, you you better think it over. Before. Oh, I don't have to think it over. I know right now. All right, meet me tomorrow and we'll draw up the paper. Where? Jasper's Wharf, 10 o'clock. I'll be there, but I'm... I say it ain't oh, for you. It's Mr. Rick. He's coming in. He mustn't see us together. Here, what's the matter? I'll get out the back way. Don't forget, 10 o'clock. Right. No, 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 no. I tell you, it's impossible. But he said he was sure it was the retriever, sir. Oh, wait a minute. Well, young fella, who are you? I'm a Blue Star officer, sir. I can see that by your cap, you idiot. Just come from the docks? Yes, sir. You know my barkentine retriever when you see her? Yes, sir. The retriever's anchored off of Meg's wharf. There, sir. Are you sure, young fella? Absolutely. Well, I guess it must be true, Skinner. That squarehead captain was made good. List him for a better ship. Yes, sir. Now, mate, what do you want? I've done a report, sir. From what ship? The retriever. Why doesn't Captain Peterson report himself? He was taken to the Marine Hospital as soon as we docked. He got sort of smashed up in Cape Town. Who smashed him? I did, sir. Then you, you're... Yes, sir, I'm Matt Peasley. Why, you freshwater gumdrop? Don't what do you... you mean by standing there and lying to me? Don't you call me a liar. This is my office, I'll call you Take what I like. Take back what you said or I'll heave you out that window. What? Why, you pea green deck swabber. Mr. Rick, Captain Peasley, stand please. back. If he was a couple of years older, I'd wring his neck for him. By old, you mean it. I mean what I say, I don't fight with kids. Now, mate, you listen to me. You beat up Peterson. I did. It was a pleasure. You know what it means? It's mutiny on the high seas. That's what it means. Captain Peterson had credentials. He might have had them, but he didn't present them. He climbed on board and presented his two fists. And you bashed them in, huh? Right. <laughs> I suppose you know you've made us more trouble than any other man we've had in our employ. That's your fault, Mr. Rick. My fault? Look here, yeah, you young you let me snipe. alone. Yeah, if you let me alone, I'd have brought that boat back and there wouldn't have been any trouble. Well, you'll never get the chance to bring back another. You're fired. You can't fire a man that's already quit. And now, Cappy, Rick's goodbye. Don't call me Cappy. All right, then, Mr. Rick. And write this in your log. The next time you pick a fight with one of your employees, make mighty sure he isn't from Thomaston, Maine, where they turn out real sailors. Goodbye. Peasley. Thomaston, Maine. Peasley, of course. What is it, Mr. Riggs? I know that boy. I knew his father. The finest family of sailors that ever hauled a rope. Skinner, I want that boy for our line. But you just told him... Never mind that. You go find him and bring him back here. That boy's going to work for me. So, uh, I told Skinner to go and get him. But he couldn't find him, just my luck. More string beans, Cappy? Huh? Oh, all right, sis. They're kind of burned, though. Indeed, they are not. All right, all right, let's have them. How about you, Flory? Flory, your Aunt Lucy is speaking to you. Oh, uh, what was it, Aunt Lucy? She said, did you want some string beans? Oh, no, thanks. You're acting awfully funny tonight, Flory. What happened to you today? Nothing. That Dad wouldn't give me a job. Now, now, Flory. Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you again. Well, now you're talking. But this time it is money. Oh, how much? Oh, just a drop in the bucket, Dad. Hmm. How big a drop? Five thousand dollars. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> that ain't a drop. It's a splash. What do you want it for? Charity again? Well, in a way. What do you mean, in a way? Is, is it charity or ain't it? 
Well, charity's helping people out, isn't it? Yeah. Then it's charity. Now listen, Flory. Kathy. What? You might just as well save your breath. There isn't any use arguing because you always give in in the end anyway. Oh, I do, huh? Of course you do, darling. That's why I love you so much. <laughs> Is that so? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well? Oh, all right, all right. I'll give you a check in the morning. <laughs> Come right in, Captain Peasley. Well, well, well. How are you, Peasley? Good morning. I found him for you, Mr. Rake. Fine, fine. Sit down, Matt. Sit down. Just a minute. I don't know what you want me for, and I don't care very much. But whatever it is, let's get it over quickly. Sure, uh, sure. You, you see, Matt, I made a little mistake about you yesterday, and uh, I've changed my mind. I want you to take command of the retriever. There, now. What do you think of that? Very little. Huh? I don't want the job. Why not? Because I'm going into business for myself. <laughs> Did you hear that, Skinner? <laughs> He's going into business for himself. <laughs> Whose peanut stand are you going to buy out? I'm going into the shipping business, Mr. Ricks. What? And it takes you down a little, doesn't it? I got a partner with money. We drew up the agreement this morning. From now on, Mr. Ricks, you've got a competitor. Why? A real one. Huh? We'll make you square, Mr. Ricks. You'll wish you'd never heard of me. Skinner, show this man out. No, don't show him out. Throw him out. Mr. Ricks. I can go myself. You bet you can go. You're fired, do you hear? You fired me yesterday. Well, you're fired again today. Now get out of here and start your business. And when I've skinned you clean down to your hide, come back and see me. If I'm in a good humor, I might lend you a barrel. <laughs> We'll continue with Cappy Ricks in a moment. Now, let's visit one of Hollywood's leading department stores. Mr. James Brown enters the lingerie department feeling, uh, well, uh, a bit like a fish out of water. Like most men, he hesitates to enter this feminine domain, but he has to. He's returned a lace-trimmed satin nightgown which he had bought as a birthday gift for his wife. He explains his errand to a sales girl and then... Didn't your wife like it, sir? It's a gorgeous gown. Oh, yes, yeah, she likes it, thinks it's lovely, but, uh, well, she doesn't feel we can afford it. It's probably my fault. I've heckled her quite a bit about clothes bills. But, Mr. Brown, this gown is pure dye satin. We'll wear for ages. <laughs> that is, if it's washed carefully. Huh? Well, how do you wash the things? Well, I always advise Lux Flakes. Uh, tell your wife to turn it wrong side out before washing it. Look. Why don't you take the gown home again and take along with it this Lux washing leaflet? Well, uh... I know if she washes it with Lux flakes, the gown will stay in you looking for so long, she won't think it's a bit extravagant. Well, uh, I guess I will take it back. <laughs> she really liked it. And uh, thanks for the tip about Lux. Yes, that sales girl is right. If you use Lux flakes, even the daintiest lingerie will stay like new so long that it isn't extravagant. Lux underthings after every wearing. This protects daintiness and at the same time keeps the garment new looking. So for daintiness and economy, always wash under things in Lux. And now, back to Mr. DeMille. Once more, we bring you Cappy Ricks with Charles Winninger, Sally Eilers, and Richard Allen. Six weeks have passed since Matt Peasley and Flory Ricks entered into their secret partnership. Cappy doesn't know, of course, that his daughter is his competitor. And Matt still thinks her name is Ellen Brown. We're in the sparsely furnished office of the Red Diamond Line, where Flower is now working. We find her at her desk as the phone rings. Red Diamond Line. Is this Matt Beasley's office? Yes, sir. Then by the pink tote prophet, I want to talk with him. This is Mr. Rick speaking. Mr. Peasley's busy just now. So am I, and I haven't any time to waste arguing with a female windjammer. Are you wasting it? What's that? If you're trying to get fresh with me, young lady, you'd better think twice. I'm not taking any fancy talk from anyone, man or woman. Who's that on the phone, Ellen? Wait a minute, Matt. Hello? May I take a message, Mr. Ricks? What? I said, may I take a message? Man, what? You know, uh, there's something familiar about your voice, young lady. Well, what's your name? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm not allowed to discuss personal matters during business hours. What? Well, listen, young lady. 
Do you know who I am? Oh, yes, sir. Very well. Then from now on, we'll get somewhere. Throw all that regular office lingo into the discard and give me Matt Peasley. Mm, I'm sorry. He's too busy to talk now. Oh, he is, is he? Well, tell him for me that he's an ungrateful sea dog. And if he thinks he can lick me, he's as crazy as a coot. Goodbye. (laughs) Was that Rex? Yes. You're getting under his skin. Oh, Matt, isn't it simply gorgeous? Things are beginning to break. Say, they've broken already. You remember what you told me about that Mason and Barber's contract expiring with Rex? Yes. Well, we landed that contract. No. Yes, yeah, all signed, sealed, and delivered and in my pocket. We'll make $5,000. He told that me... That wipes out what you borrowed. He told me I didn't know anything about the shipping. Huh? Who? Uh, oh, nothing. Nothing, Matt. It's just that I'm happy. You don't know how happy. Ah. Uh, Ellen, you're a wonder. It's been fun, hasn't it? Wondering if anything was going to happen. Almost going overboard and now everything working out just the way we wanted it. Oh, it's been the grandest six weeks I've ever known. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have a sign put up outside, Peasley and Brown, Red Diamond Line. Oh, no, no, Matt. Why, what's the matter? I, well, you mustn't say anything about me. You promised you wouldn't. But you're my partner. I don't see why. Please, Matt, you mustn't. All right. Hey, but what about that other partnership I suggested? Does that have to be silent, too? Other partnership? You know, the one that has the ring to go with it. Oh, that one. I'm serious, Ellen. So am I. We'll have to wait, Matt. Oh, I'm crazy about you. I guess I've told you that a hundred times. I never get tired of hearing it. Then why do we have to wait? Because, oh, Matt, you're just getting started. You've got a long way to get, Jed, and I want to see you get there. I want to see you become the biggest man on the street. And you will, too. Yeah, but, but what's that got to do with us getting married? Oh, I don't know, Matt, except I'd rather not. For a while, anyhow. Well, I guess I'll just have to wait. Don't make it too long, though, will you? It'll be just as long for me, Matt. Oh, Ellen. Matt. Oh, Matt, stop. Not here. What would a client think if he walked in here and found you kissing your secretary? I don't know. But I'll bet a schooner against the door eh, that he tried to hire you away. <laughs> evening, Bridget. Oh, good evening, sir. You're home early. Uh, Miss Lucy around? Yes, sir. She's out on the back porch. Watching the ships again, huh? All right, I'll run out and give her a hail. Where are we, messmate? <laughs> Squinting through the binoculars, Lucy. Plain startled me, Kathy. I can't be startled when you're on duty, Lucy. You're a mistress of my home port, aren't you? There are times when I wonder. Was the ship you were looking at coming in or going out? Coming in. Was she wearing the blue star? No, no, a pennant I never saw before. A yellow field with a red diamond. Oh, blast the red diamond. Why, Alden P. Ricks. Excuse me, sister, but that's just the way I feel. Red diamond, red diamond. That's all I've been hearing for the last ten weeks. And now I come home and I get it here. It's getting on my nerves. Well, what is the red diamond? A new line? It's a fluke. One of those mushroom companies that spring up one night and disappear the next. I'd give $10,000 to find out who's behind her. And call it an investment, a good one. You don't mean... That they're taking business away from the Blue Star. Lucy, they're walking all over oh, us. Oh, no. Got us covered with blood, that's all. You know what they've done to us? Bought two ships out from under our nose. Alden. Oh, that isn't all. They sold them for a third more than they paid for them. Well, that sounds like good business. Good business, just darn fool luck. Wouldn't happen again in 50 years. And what did they do two days ago? You'd better come into the house, Alden. Took two of my best captains away from me. Men who have been interested in the Blue Star for years and owned an interest in their ships. They walked out and left me. I never heard of such a thing. Left the Blue Star, a five million dollar corporation, to go with a fly-by-night shoestring mushroom company that's liable to hit the ceiling any minute. Alden, why don't you give up the fight and and retire? 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 (laughs) Plenty of time for a man to retire when he's old. I'm only 60. Quit and let that boy whip me. By the horn toad, I will not. No, sir. Why, Lucy, I'm tickled to death over this fight. By the time I've demolished, pulverized, and obliterated this red diamond outfit, I'll be ten years younger. Oh, Mr. Ricks, I'm so glad you're here. 
What in tarnation is the matter with you, Skinner? I've been arriving at this office at the same time for the last 20 years. Yes, sir, but this morning... Oh, Mr. Rick, something awful has happened. Skinner, you're as white as a new mainsail. Don't stand there shivering. What is it? What's the bad news? It's the Baxter contract. Well, what of it? Morgan Baxter is one of our oldest customers. He was, Mr. Riggs. What's that? You told me to run over this morning and sew up his business for the coming year. Of course I did. Baxter's the biggest contract we've got. You didn't want him to do a mason and barber and slip away from us, did you? He has slipped. What? Yes, sir. He's, he's going to give his business to another line. Which one? I don't know, sir. He wouldn't say. But they've offered him a lower shipping rate on faster boats. By the pink-toed prophet! Lower rates, eh? That means whoever made the offer knew just what we were charging. Yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Ricks, you've got to do something. The Baxter business means the difference between profit and loss. I know that, you blame fool. We've got our backs right against the wall. But we're not licked yet, Skinner. No, sir. Not by a long shot. We've got to start fighting. But we have been fighting. All I want to know is which line it was that underbid us. That's all. You don't suppose it was the uh, red diamond? The red diamond? <laughs> but Mr. Riggs. Could a ten-cent outfit like that underbid the blue star? No, sir, but I have. Would they know what we were charging? No, sir, only there have been... Ah, oh, Skinner, you're a waddling landlubber. Yes, sir. Red diamond. Red diamond. <laughs> oh, yes? That's pretty rich, yes? Yeah? Oh, yes, one moment. It's for you, Mr. Ricks. The red diamond line calling. Huh? What do they want? I don't know. Hello. Hello. Well, you don't have to yell. I'm not yelling. I can hear you. This is Matt Peasley talking. Oh, Matt Peasley. Well, well. Would you like that barrel now, Mr. Peasley, or will you wait a couple of weeks? Mr. Ricks, I'd like to rent a couple of your ships. Oh, you would? Well, that's fine. Rent a couple of my boats, eh? I'll pay you for them, of course. You see, I'm kind of rushed over here. What? Rush? Yeah, I expect to be very busy the next few months. I just signed that Baxter contract. What? I just signed the Baxter contract. Oh, you did, eh? Why, you double-dealing deckhand, you? You pork-swilling excuse for an able seaman? I'll have your hide for this. About those boats? No, you can't have them. You can't have anything, you double-crossing, slink-eyed cutthroat. All right, so long, Cappy. See you in the poorhouse. What? Hello? Hello! <laughs> See me in the poorhouse, will you? See me in... Well, what are you standing around for, Skinner? Do something. Do something. But Mr. Ricks, I don't know He's what He's got do. that contract. Do you understand? He stole it right from under your nose. My nose? Yes, your nose. Skinner, you're fired. Again? Yes, again. I, uh, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. I got an idea. Come here, Skinner. But you just fired me. Well, now, wait a minute. Don't get so touchy, Skinner. I... Listen... Uh, did you say that Baxter said that the Red Diamond said they'd get faster boats? Is that what you said? I'm afraid I don't understand. Did the Red Diamond agree to use faster ships than the Blue Star? Yes, sir. Then we've got them. Got who? The Red Diamond. Skinner, there are only two ships in this port that are faster than the Blue Star boats. The Unicorn and the Island Shipper. we got to buy them. Buy two boats? Yes, buy them. Peasley won't be able to live up to the terms of the contract. His boats won't be fast enough. And we'll get the business back again from Baxter. But two boats and finances the way they are. It will break us. Let it. It'll break the Red Diamond, too. And that's what I want. Skinner, get the owner of the Unicorn and the Island Shipper now. Have him come to the house the first thing in the morning. Tell him I'll have a blank check ready and he can name his own price. <laughs> Alden Ricks, what's the matter with you? Huh? You haven't even touched your breakfast. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm not very hungry this morning, Lucy. Anything wrong? Wrong? No, not a thing. It's as right as rain. Oh, Mr. Ricks. Yeah? There's a man here to see you. Oh, that's, that's, that's what I've been waiting for. Where is he, Bridget? Out in the living room. I told him you were having your breakfast. Excuse me, Lucy. You'll be back in a minute. Well, I never. What's the matter with him anyhow? Well, well, well. Good morning, Mr... Hiya, Mr. Ricks. Uh, what are you doing here? I'm ready to talk business, Mr. Ricks. Well, I'm not. I talked all the business I wanted with you on the phone. And if you'll excuse me, I'm expecting somebody important. The owner of the Unicorn and Island Shipper? Huh? How did you know that? Oh, little bird told me. He did, eh? Well, go back and ask him what you can do about it. 
I did, and you know what he said? He said, Matt, he always calls me Matt. Now, listen here. I'm a busy man. He said, Matt, you go out and get options on those two boats that Cappy Riggs wants. Huh? And that's just what I did. So if you want to buy them, Mr. Riggs, you will have to buy them for me. And I'm not selling. Oh. You, uh... You got the boats, eh? Yes, sir. And you, you'll be able to live up to that contract now. That's why I got them. Yeah, well... You're smart, Peasley. You're you're real smart. I I I know when I'm beaten. Well, that sort of winds up the conclave, don't it? I guess so. Yeah, you, you've done it. Done it all right, Mr. Ricks. I uh, you've licked me, stripped off all my rigging. Well, I've ripped the rigging off of other fellows in my day. Yep. Good sailing. I'm finished, Peasley. Finished? You've done a complete job. About the only thing left for me to do is to write my own business obituary. You mean you're broke? Yeah. Clean. Dad. Hey, yes, honey. Ellen, what are you doing here? Uh, Ellen? Who's Ellen? I heard what you said, Matt. I couldn't help hearing it as I came downstairs. Why were you upstairs? Huh? Well, I'd like to know who's a better right to be up there. She's been in the habit of going up and down the stairs in this house ever since she was born. You didn't expect to take that away from the Ricks family, did you? The Ricks family? Yes, ma'am. I'm Flory Ricks. Oh, I see. Well, I don't. I... It's all very clear now. Can't you understand? It was all right fighting Dad. It was fun as long as it was only a lesson. It gave me the chance to prove I could do something. When I heard him tell you, oh, we mustn't ruin his business, that's Dad's life. Well, by the pink-toed prophet, will somebody be good enough to explain what's going on here in my own cabin? You didn't even tell me what your name was. I couldn't. You wouldn't have listened to me. You know you wouldn't have listened, Matt. Well, I mean, but what I did, didn't I? Oh, I should have known better than to take a woman as a partner. Now, look here, you young swab. This is my business, not yours. Matt, please. Oh, fine. Swell. Good joke, even if it is on me. You can have your Baxter contract, Mr. Ricks. I wouldn't touch it. But the fun isn't over. We've been fooling before, but now you're going to see some real fighting. Matt! Oh, Dad. Dad. Well, it, it looks like I'm about the biggest fool that ever walked the deck. So that's why you wanted that $5,000, so you could go into business with that... Oh, Dad, that... I'm sorry. I didn't know it would turn out like this. I, I only wanted to show you that I did know something, and now... Oh, Daddy hates me. Say, are you worried about him or me? <laughs> he hates me. Well, he hasn't exactly expressed undying affection for me, either. Oh, I'll never see him again. And a good thing, too. Oh, Dad, you don't understand. I love him. What? You love that knock-kneed, bow-legged excuse for a sailor? Oh, stop it! All right, all right. He, he's not knock-kneed. But, Flory... Oh, Flory, do you, you really love him? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, by the pink toad, she loves him. Lucy, Lucy, come here quick. I'll show that knock need. I'll show that sailor he can't... Alden, Rick, what's come over you? Stop dancing around that way. Uh, go order the car, Lucy. The car? Yes, the car. Get my hat and stick for me. And where in thunder are my shoes? I can't go downtown in my slippers. But, Alden, your breakfast. I'm not hungry. I'm filled up. I'll teach that young pup a lesson. What's a fight, eh? Well, he'll get one. I'll make his blood tingle if it costs my last dollar. Lucy, where are my shoes? We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNX, the Columbia Station, Los Angeles. Charles Winninger, Sally Eilers, and Richard Arlen continue in Cappy Rick shortly. Twenty-seven years ago, a young man walked out of a San Francisco hospital, wondering where the money was coming from to pay his doctors and nurses' bills. Not having anything better to do, he sat down and wrote a, sh a short story based on characters he'd encountered in his last job in the lumber and shipping business. The story was purchased immediately, and since then, the pen of Peter B. Kine has never rested. Creator of Cappy Ricks, he has written 26 novels and over 300 short stories, 70 of which have been purchased by motion pictures. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter B. Kind. Uh, 
thank you, Mr. DeMille. While most of my Capric stories are based on fact, neither Cappy nor Matt Peasy, Peasley ever really lived. But they're the combination of many men whom it was my good fortune to know. The last of that old acquisitive breed who sailed many years ago from New England to write the last chapter of romance, furl the last sail in the port of San Francisco. While courage was the birthright of these men, yet they knew tolerance and philosophy. They were great readers and certainly the last, last race on earth, really appreciative of the art of conversation. What was the flash of inspiration, Mr. Kine, that resulted in Cappy Rick? Uh, Cappy was more accident than inspiration. He appeared first in a short story which I considered nothing more than run-of-the-mill at a fiction foundry. Well, it seems it turned out to be something else. Of your best sellers, such as The Pride of Palomar, Three Godfathers, The Valley of the Giants, and Kindred of the Dust, which do you like best? Probably The Go-Getter, which is Mr. Willinger's new film for Warner Brothers. Not long after I had submitted it to Cosmopolitan magazine, I overheard a salesman taking an order for 100 copies of a new inspirational book by Peter B. Kine. I wired my publisher that I had not written any inspirational story and to see selling me under false pretenses. Two hours later, I received a reply. You poor simpy informed me you don't know what you write. The Go-Getter was one of the finest inspirational stories we've ever seen. As for royalties, you can thank heaven we'll pay you the same as heretofore. That was 15 years ago, Mr. DeMille, and copies of the book are still selling, but the publishers and I have never signed a contract. <laughs> How much time, Mr. Kind, do you give yourself to turn out a story? Well, the fastest work I ever did was on Three Godfathers and The Go-Getter. Each was completed between 8 in the morning and midnight. I take things easier now and think 3,000 words a day just about justify my existence. And since I haven't written a line today, I'd better get back to my typewriter right now. But before I do, I think you'd be interested to know, Mr. DeMille, that I used to wash Cappy Ricks in Lux Flakes. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Cappy. <laughs> excuse me, but the, the fiction on this program is confined to the play. But this is true, Mr. DeMille. You see, Cappy Ricks was also the name of one of my dogs, an English setter. I thought a lot of Cappy, and knowing that anything safe in water alone is safe in Lux, I always washed him with it. It made his coat shine like a new penny, and I assure you, Cappy never shrunk once. Good night. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Kahn. We continue with Cappy Ricks, starring Charles Winninger with Sally Eilers and Richard Allen. <laughs> It's early the next morning. In the office of the Red Diamond Line, Matt Peasley stands by the window, staring moodily into the street. The door opens, and Flurry enters quietly. Matt. Ellen. Flurry now. Yes, I know. Oh, Matt, I had to come down. I couldn't stand it any longer. Oh, I've started for your house at least ten times. Why didn't you come? Fool pride, I guess. I'm sorry about yesterday. I I just lost my head. Well, you had good reason to. Well, Matt, what are we going to do? Oh, I don't know. Your father was here yesterday. He threw the Baxter contract back in my face. Said he wasn't interested in charity. Said he'd rather get it by fighting or not at all. Matt, I, I've got to stick with Dad. You understand that, don't you? Oh, of course. He's an old man. He needs me. Maybe, maybe someday it'll all work out and we can go on like before. Maybe. I'll always love you, Matt, no matter what happens. Flory, if, if your father got his business back again, pulled out of the rut, would it, would it make any difference to you? I don't know what you mean. Well, if you didn't have to worry about competition, losing business, would you be free then to do as you want? I, I think so. Oh, but you're not thinking of... Oh, I don't know what I'm thinking of. All I know is that I've made a lot of money out of this business and had a lot of success, and it doesn't mean a thing without you, Flory. Oh, darling... The mate told the crew, the crew told me, so I know it must be true. You hear some funny yarns while sailing o'er the sea. That's the little yarn you heard aboard the ship. The doodle dum doodle dum Oh, good afternoon, Skinner. Mr. Ricks, was that you singing? No one else, Skinner. I'm a new man. Yes, sir, a new man. But dear me, but what's happened? I Push don't... old Cappy Ricks into the scuppers, will they? 
Beat him at the game he's been playing for years? Ha, <laughs> ha. I'd like to see someone do it. Oh, the captain told the maid. The maid told the crew. You think you could use a hundred shares of Blue Star stock, Skinner? Why, Mr. Riggs. She's going up, Skinner. Hundred shares of stock. Sixteen hundred a share. But, Mr. Riggs, I can't buy a hundred shares of stock. Why, I'm giving it to you. A nest egg for your old age. Oh, I don't know how to thank you. I don't want any thanks. I'm celebrating, Matt. You know, Matt Peasley thought he had me down and out, didn't he? Huh? <laughs> Skinner, I won a great victory this afternoon. Victory? Sure, I've got the Baxter contracts. What? Sold up tight as a cock ship. He called me up at the house an hour ago and begged me to come down. Then then we won't have to close up. We'll climb up to new heights. The Blue Star's under fresh steam. You can't wallop an old sea dog and make him stay wallop. <laughs> oh, Mr. Oh. Ricks, what is it? Oh, oh Lord. <laughs> I'm out of wind. Oh, here, sit down. Sit down, Mr. Oh, Vicks. stay put. I'm all right. I just misjudged the old boilers. Oh, uh, there. Now I'm fit as a new craft. Well, what are you staring at? It all has the ring of a miracle, Mr. Vicks. A miracle? <laughs> it's experience. That's what it is. Smart businessman realizing that the tired horse... Is safer than a coat that has nothing but fight. What does Matt Peasley say? Him? Well, uh, Skinner, that's the one sore spot. It'll hurt Peasley mortal. Put him right out of business, and it'll hurt Flory, too. Yes, sir, I suppose it will. Yeah, kind of takes all the fun out of the winning, Skinner. When you know it's hurting people... Skinner, why didn't you choke me before I fired Matt Peasley? But you fire so many people, sir, and then take them back again. Well, well, it's hard to know what to do. That's it. Yes, sir. That's it. What? I got to get him back. Skinner, go get him and bring him here. But, Mr. Reed. And don't come back and say you can't find him. Go on now. Hurry up. Hurry up. This is important. <laughs> Well, well, come right in, Matt. Come in, Flory. <laughs> it took a woman to bring you in, eh, Peasley? Yes, sir. Well, Skinner, don't stand there. Get a couple of chairs for our guests. Oh, yes, Mr. Riggs. Well, Peasley, finally moored in the home port, eh? <laughs> Looks natural here, don't he, Flory? He certainly does, Dad. Mr. Riggs, sir. Uh... Silence. Stand by. I'm in command of this ship. <coughs> well... What is it, Peasley? I wanted to come over and congratulate you, Mr. Riggs. Now you're talking... To... What's that? Well, I'm beating you. Whip me. Oh. Baxter contract set me up so no one could whip me. Now you have that contract, and I... I guess you know the rest. Yes, I, I know. You know more about this game than I do, and I... I guess I'm nothing but a rank beginner. Well, congratulations. Do you mean what you're saying? I do, sir. Well, scuttle my timbers. I want to apologize for the things I said when I first reported in this office. I'm also sorry about the way I acted in your home yesterday. Have you lost your mind, Peasley? Well, no, I, I hope I found it. Why, you lopsided landlubber. You've laid down and quit. You've lost your nerve, struck your colors. You despicable swab. Dad, Keep Dad. out of this, Flory. You weak-kneed cockalorum. You big overgrown dub, I can take you in my hands. I guess that's enough. Matt. There's a limit to what a man can take or be expected to take. You're going past that limit, Ricks. Oh, so you make your own limit. Yeah, I made them in this case. <laughs> you old son of a sea cook. <laughs> you still know how to fight. What's that? Uh, I got under your skin. What do you mean? Mean? <laughs> you don't think I wanted a man with milk in his veins for a partner, do you? Oh, Dad. A partner? But I don't... Ah, keep your mouth shut. If I want to combine the blue star and the red diamond, I have a right to combine them, haven't I? A man can do as he wants with the fruits of victory when he's outsmarted a clever enemy, can't he? <laughs> Skinner! But I... What's the matter with Skinner? You don't suppose he collapsed trying to carry a couple of chairs around here? Skinner! You heard what he said, Flory. Oh, Matt, I knew Dad wouldn't let you down. The contract was Baxter. Did you arrange that? Yeah. You see, I, I called Baxter and told him I couldn't possibly live up to the terms. I 
Well, I advised him to give it back to the Blue Star. And... Oh, darling. Well, I wouldn't tell your father if I were you. Oh, of course not. He loves to win that. It would break his heart to accept a favor. Well, he, he'll never find out from me. Oh, Matt. I love you so. Sorry. Come in, Skinner. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come here, Skinner. I want you to meet your new boss. What? As a stockholder of the Blue Star, you have the right to know what's going on here. Skinner, this is the proudest moment of my life. <laughs> I licked the crust two ways. <laughs> and now, Mr. Peasley? I, uh, I don't know what to say. Well, I'll do the talking for both. You told Flory Ricks you cheated you, didn't you? Yes, but... You then... got pretty high and mighty with her, telling her she couldn't run up and down stairs in her own house, didn't you? Well, I've told Flory... I and it. That's what you were. You took the tiller, canvas, pilot house, and your teeth. Well, that's all right for a partner. But it's bad for a fiancé. Mm, very bad, Matt. But wait a minute. I... Silence! I'm master of this craft. And now my fine salt water Lotharia... I'll give you one minute to propose to Flory Ricks. And 30 seconds after you finish to kiss her. He's done that already. Oh, he has, has he? Then clear out of this office. How can we handle business with two lovesick calves mooning all over the place? Well, Mr. Ricks... Get out of here. Skinner, open the door. Yes, sir. Vamoose! And stay vamoose. I don't want to see either of you until after the honeymoon. Goodbye, darling. So long, Cappy. So long. Why, Mr. Ritz, what's the matter? Skinner, come here. Skinner, he thinks he fooled me. What's that? Matt, he thinks he handed me Baxter's contract on a silver platter. You mean he didn't? No, you blame fool. I was in Baxter's office when he called. I had the whole thing sewed up then. But, but how? I found out that the charter of the Red Diamond Line was taken out in the name of Matt Peasley and Ellen Brown. Well, there wasn't any Ellen Brown, and every one of their contracts was illegal. Oh, <laughs> and, he, and he thinks he did you a favor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Skinner, I always told you that no man ever made a monkey out of Cappy Rick. No, sir. <laughs> no, sir, no. Uh, but that young whip came awfully close to it. Yeah. <laughs> So we take our leave of Cappy Ricks. Charles Wynn and Just Sally Islas and Richard Arlen return to the microphone a little later. With more than 200 pictures to his credit, Roya ranks among the best-known costume designers in America. Former designer for leading Fifth Avenue salons, lecturer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and at New York and Columbia universities, he's now at 20th Century Fox Studios creating the costumes for such well-dressed young ladies as Loretta Young, Alice Faye, Anne Southern, Barbara Stanwyck, Sonia Henney, Madeline Carroll, and Shirley Temple. Ladies and gentlemen, Roya. Thank you. With spring just three weeks off, let us take a quick look at what fashions are going to appear in the Easter parade. Skirts will be shorter, shoes will be higher, hats will be lower. Skirts worn for streetwear will have a definite swing effect, and you'll see considerable leather and suede taking the place of and being combined with fabrics. Styles follow definite cycles, and we are due for the return of many trends that originated between the gay 90s and 1914. Don't laugh at your wife if she comes home wearing ankle-length shoes. They're really most attractive, particularly if they have those old-fashioned buttons and elastic gores, such as worn by Loretta Young in Daryl Zanuck's production, Love is News. Longer, fuller veils are with us, and embroidery, brilliance and beading, are back again on formal daytime and evening gowns. Now, the contents of the daily newspapers have a marked influence on style. What events this year will be interpreted into fashions? The Spanish War will popularize the bolero jacket and the torador hat. Egypt, India, and Persia are giving us a decided taste <clears throat> for stripes and banding. The Greeks contributed classic drapes and sculptured folds for evening gowns while Great Britain, in crowning a king, will popularize the striking coronation colors and the wearing of feathers. Hmm. It won't be the first time England has officially entered fashion. Back in the 16th century, ruffles became so prodigious that their dimensions were limited by act of parliament. And we've just decided to curb the height of my lady's bonnet, 
but without calling on the Marines. The full-crowned steeple effects are being reduced to low turbines and sailors. And once again, we'll be able to see the screen when we go to the movies. Tell me, why has Hollywood been able to compete so successfully with Paris as America's fashion factory? Simply because mm. Hollywood directs its styles for American taste characterizing them with simplicity, in sympathy with everybody's pocketbook. But whatever the styles may be, clothes will last longer, look nicer when cared for in Lux Flakes. When we finish a day's shooting at 20th Century Fox, all co washable costumes are made ready for the following day by getting them together with Lux Flakes in the laundry. A good example is found in Ann Southern's next picture, Fifty Roads to Town, and does most of her acting in a nightgown. And although we've been on this picture for over six weeks, She's still using the same one she started with. It's not because we're trying to save money by limiting Anne to one nightgown. It's simply a fact that things seem to last twice as long when cared for in Lux. Thank you, and I'll see you in the movies. <laughs> After a fashion. <laughs> During the war, Hollywood, like every community, had its companies of home guards. I found myself captain of one outfit whose ranks included Jack Holt and Wallace Reed but whose particular boast was a brass band with Jesse Lasky playing the cornet. It was an almost perfect band, but for the persistence of the trombone player, who was in such a hurry to win the war that he was always three bars ahead of everyone else. For 20 years, I wanted to tell that musician what I thought of his playing. And if Sally Eilers and Richard Arlen will escort him to the microphone, I'll tell him now. Corporal Winninger, front and center. Now, just a minute, just a minute. I joined the Army to serve my country, but instead of giving me a rifle... You hand me a trombone. Well, they probably figured you could do more damage with a trombone, Charlie. Oh. I really think you should be forgiven, Mr. Winninger. After all, a man who's been captain as consistently as you should have been put in the Navy. Thanks, Charlie. But since coming to Hollywood this time, all I play is fathers. I've just made four pictures, and every one of them, I'm Papa. But well, what have you been playing, Dick? Dick's been playing golf. Oh. <laughs> I think we'd better skip that by, Sally. Oh, I don't know. You were in nearly every big tournament in the country. We're all proud of you, Dick. You're the most consistent player in Hollywood. Oh, I'm consistent, all right. I lost every match I entered. But I haven't given up hope yet, and I hope I'm going to Georgia next month to see if they'll let me play in the Bobby Jones tournament in Augusta. Well, now, Dick, just perform as splendidly as you do in your new picture, The Great Barrier, and the cup's as good as yours right now. Thanks a lot. Hey, Mr. DeMille, I understand you're interested in boats, and so I'm going to challenge you to a race. I'm having a schooner built over in Finland, and as soon as she's ready, let's see if... Uh, a well, better sailor than a golfer. Now, at your service, Dick. And you and I, Sally, we'll take a rowboat and show them both the thing about navigation. Huh? <laughs> you bet we will, Kathy. But in the meantime, Mr. DeMille, I'll be listening for you every Monday night. And all my thanks for a very nice time. And I guess that goes for us, too. Ain't it? Huh? Right. Good night, all. Good night. So long, mates. Thank you, Mr. Winninger, Miss Eilers, and Mr. Allen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Ruick. In just a minute, Mr. DeMille brings word of next week's gala attraction. Our stars tonight were assisted by Byron K. Folger as Skinner, Janet Scott as Lucy Ricks, Kenneth Hansen as Gordon, Frank Cogdon Jr. as Jimmy, and Maureen Roden Ryan as Bridget. Mr. Winninger and Miss Eilers appeared through courtesy of Universal Studios. Mr. DeMille, Paramount, and Royer and Mr. Silver's 20th Century Fox, where the latter was in charge of music for the new film Nancy Steele is Missing. Once again, Mr. DeMille. There's a sensational new team in motion pictures, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> which we bring to the Lux Radio Theater next Monday night. Grace Moore and Cary Grant. Our presentation, a play based on Velasco's immortal production, Madame Butterfly, with some of the music from Puccini's opera of the same name. For Miss Moore and Mr. Grant, this will be a return engagement. And coming to us this time in Madame Butterfly assures us all a brilliant evening. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Grace Moore and Cary Grant in Madame Butterfly. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.